I just want to start off with, uh, well, it's kind of about the Fed, really. It's, it's the top story on Bloomberg at the moment. Uh, companies with a lot of debt seem to be outperforming at the moment, so the rate cuts are kind of working. But I, I'm just wondering if you see that money being invested in CapEx, uh, is it going to be reflected in earnings? Because nobody was really complaining that borrowing was too expensive, were they? No, Paul, and I suspect a lot of this may be along the lines of a technical bounce. You know the big divergence that has taken place between so-called growth stocks and value stocks? Value stocks have low PEs, in large part because they are sensitive to the economic cycle, their fundamentals may not be strong. So look, if this drive is being influenced by leverage, high debt on the balance sheet, that's hardly a winning strategy for the long term. It has its place every now and then on a tactical basis, but don't get tricked by this. Growth is going to be scarce going forward, and high-quality growth companies with high free cash flow margins will continue to do well for a long time. Yes, well, you, you had a very cup-half-full kind of attitude towards second quarter earnings. As the third quarter uh, dates approach, I'm just wondering what you're expecting to see there. Well, look, we can practically write this year off. There is no earnings growth. This is going to be the year of flat earnings growth. But yet the market is up a handsome 20 percent. It's all because of multiple expansion. We had this massive sell-off in December that put the S&P 500 forward P.E. at only 13 and a half times. And in this era of low interest rates, the fair P.E. on stocks, it's not the historical 15 times forward. It's not 16. I might argue it's 17 or 18. So this has been the year of the multiple expansion. There are some green shoots that are emerging on the economic front, manufacturing PMI that was reported mid-month seems to have turned a corner. There has been a lot of global easing. There is concerted global easing. And hopefully, as diminished as the effectiveness of monetary policy is, maybe that will kick in and we see a revival of growth and therefore an uptick in earnings. Sandeep, let me go into individual sectors because we saw just last week Micron really disappointing markets. This GTV chart on the Bloomberg showing how the semiconductor index has really rallied. That's the line in blue, expecting that the prices of chips would bottom out. But as you can see, that line in white is really not going anywhere, it seems. Do you still like the tech sector when there's so much industry pressure, not to mention that they're very, very sensitive to the trade tensions right now? So semiconductor stocks are caught up right in the throes. They're in the crosshairs of the global trade war. There are regulatory risks floating around for the likes of Google and Facebook and Apple that have been accused of doling out preferential treatment for proprietary product placement. So there is a lot going on. But the biggest dynamic to keep in mind is that these are companies that are producing very high free cash flow margins, and those are being derived from a competitive advantage and a moat of intellectual capital that is hard to reproduce, and it is far more scalable than physical capital. So these companies have a long-term secular advantage. They're growing the trap line, and they're doing so in a very profitable manner. I'll leave you with one number. The technology sector alone accounts for one-third of the U.S. stock market's free cash flow production. That's a pretty telling statistic, and enough to overcome this temporary headwinds uh, related to regulatory risk and a trade war that could yet change literally on a tweet. And what happens when you marry this tech with the consumer stories such as Amazon when we continue to see consumer strength here in the U.S.? Uh, I think it bodes well for the likes of companies like Amazon. And as much as we think about Amazon benefiting from a technology backbone, we know the crown jewel of the company is AWS and how much operating leverage technology has created. But let's not forget the connection they have built with the consumer through a very loyal brand which allows them to do the following things. It improves user engagement and adoption. It allows them to come up with price increases, which in turn leads to scale, which gives them a competitive advantage, which helps them to gain a bigger share of transactions and therefore wallet share. 
So Amazon's value proposition, its, its economic mode and differentiating factor is the scale that an incredible brand has created, which again makes switching costs difficult and costs very hard to, to compete against.